I'm Arathi Prabhakar. I'm director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. I actually started down a technical path uh, as an engineering student and my first, uh, my first real love was actually lasers, so it's sort of fun to be back uh, talking with the photonics community. Um, and as I uh, finished graduate school, I was finishing my PhD at Caltech in 1984, and I realized that what I really cared about was what impact my technology made, and that, that I, I was really interested in taking what I'd learned in doing basic research and expanding it and seeing a, a larger landscape. Uh, I came to Washington on a congressional fellowship for what I thought would be a year, uh, and that ended up being 13 years, of which uh, I spent seven uh, at DARPA initially as a program manager and then as an office director from 1986 to 1993. And then in the Clinton administration, I was director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. After that, I spent 15 years in Silicon Valley, most of it in a venture capital firm, about a decade uh, at an early stage uh, Silicon Valley venture capital firm. And then last summer, I got the opportunity to return to DARPA, which uh, had been my first love, and I was really, really happy to have the chance to come back. I had the opportunity to spend about half my career in the private sector and about half in the public sector, and I, it's just been a terrific uh, gift to be able to see the technology system in our country from all those different vantage points. Um, I, I actually think that what we do and what venture capital does are two very, very distinct jobs. And, you know, really, if you're going to be good at what you're doing, you have to understand your mission. Our mission is to break, is to build breakthrough technologies. When I was in the venture capital business, our mission was to build great startup companies, and that's a fundamental difference. Now, the part that I think is similar is that in both cases, you work with this vast and interesting community outside your own four walls, and that's a very satisfying feeling. I think it's a very boundless feeling that I really, really particularly treasure in both of those roles. But the job that we do at DARPA is really focused on creating breakthrough technologies. We are often working well beyond where private, almost always working well beyond where private dollars can sensibly be invested. And it really is a place from which I think we're able to take a longer view and uh, to take the kind of risk that is usually inherent in reaching for really big impact. In government, I think what we've seen over a number of decades is um, uh, fairly steady uh, federal funding for R&D, some ups and downs, but fairly steady. It has not kept pace with the growth of the economy. And as a consequence, uh, when I left government about two decades ago, it was roughly in the country, we put roughly half of our R&D funding came from government and roughly half from the private sector. Today, that balance is getting closer to one third, two thirds. Uh, with, with the private sector investment continuing to grow. Now, that's wonderful, but I think that really does represent uh, that funding growth in the private sector is dominated by shorter term product development uh, spending, which is very important to companies, but it's not the same as making the investments for the long term, either the basic research or the very high risk work that can lead to big uh, steps forward. And that's what I think we need to make sure that we uh, continue to focus on in uh, the investments that we make uh, in the public sector. Sequestration uh, definitely has an impact uh, on DARPA, but uh, also across the government. It was, of course, designed to be an across-the-board set of cuts. And so uh, at DARPA specifically, it means about an 8% reduction in each of our programs. Uh, we've optimized as much as we can within each, bu each bucket of funding. But across the buckets, we are taking a, a flat cut. That's the nature of sequestration. So, um, you know, of course, we've tried to reflect our priorities uh, in the cuts that we've taken. But with that level of cut, uh, we are now uh, having to delay or defer uh, or sometimes just outright cancel things that we think really do need to be getting done. Uh, in addition, our people will participate in uh, the DOD-wide furlough once that, that gets resolved. Um, so uh, none of this in, a, in one year is a death blow to our mission, um, but it is corrosive, and that really, I think, is the challenge. And if these kinds of actions continue over time, it really will erode our ability to do our mission. The BRAIN initiative that President Obama announced recently for DARPA is a chance to continue and expand some of the work that we've been doing. Our interest began as we thought about the issues for wounded warriors, as we thought about the extraordinary stresses that they have been through, sometimes with traumatic brain injury or with 
um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, th so we had started some programs a few years ago to look at uh, questions like, could we understand how memory loss uh, was affecting brain function? Were there ways that we could understand um, uh, what was going on in a way that allowed us to fix um, that kind of short-term memory loss that we saw in many uh, wounded warriors. We also started experimenting with advances in prosthetics. Uh, and we've done some very interesting work in both of those areas that, that opens a window, I think, for first of all, a deeper understanding of brain function, but then with it, the, um, some new ideas about how we can really help our future warfighters in how they learn very complex tasks, how they operate the very complex systems that they deal with, how they deal with and then recover from uh, stresses and injuries that they are extraordinarily subject to as well. So I think it's a very promising area, both in terms of the science, but also in terms of what we're going to be able to do for the future as well. Photonics has contributed so widely um, in, in sensing and in communications and in imaging uh, across many, many aspects of the challenges that we face in the national security context. As we think about it for the brain, I think you can imagine, um, we hope that we'll see contributions from photonics as we develop the tools that allow us to understand brain function at a deeper level. If we're successful, if we do our job at DARPA and we engage with the broad technical community, including the SPIE community, then over time what we're going to do is build a new generation of technologies for national security and it's going to change the options that our future leaders have for whatever challenges our country faces. That's really why we come to work every morning. I think it's going to be a good role for photonics in that. Uh, you know, if you think about how we got where we are today, today our warfighters own the night and they actually often prefer to operate at night because they have an entire part of the electromagnetic spectrum that the other side doesn't have access to. That's because of the work we've done with IR imaging and night vision, and that's the photonics community. And if you think about advances in imaging and advanced communications, um, it's a very long list, and uh, it's, it's a set of solutions that are full of photons.